all. Welcome to another episode of Bones and Stones. Today, uh, we have something a little bit different. We have Gerrit Dusseldorp, uh, who's working at Leiden University in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, Gerrit's joining us today um, and to talk about some of his ongoing research. So he's uh, recently had a, a quite um, interesting and um, um, sort of productive debate in uh, archaeological research. Uh, we thought it might be interesting for, for people out there to sort of hear about different sides of, of ongoing debates. This happens to surround Neanderthal technology. Uh, Heritz was um, fortunate enough to find a, uh, a piece of, of glue, essentially, that was used to, to half the tool, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, and they've tried to reconstruct the, the sort of processes surrounding that, that um, type of technology. Uh, so, Herit, do you want to give us a little bit of an introduction as to, as to the find and uh, what the significance is? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Caruana. Um, so, so, this find was done on the beach near The Hague. I didn't find it myself, uh, but it was, it was found by an amateur archaeologist. I've been to the same beach looking for stuff myself, but I never find any good stuff. But luckily, um, this, this, this lady walking the beach, she found a, a, a tiny flint flake um, with what she described initially as a black blob on it. And, um, and luckily she, she registered the find. So um, when, when we heard of it, we thought, well, this, this black blob, which she, she very kindly offered to clean off the find, but we, <laughs> we decided maybe, Please, maybe don't. don't do that just yet. Um, and, uh, and because when, when we heard of it, we thought this is probably, um, um, or this might at least be birch bark tar, which was used um, in, in, by, by hunter-gatherers in the last 10,000 years to half stone tools. And there were uh, two fine spots um, where, where the same stuff was used by Neanderthals. And so this would be the third fine spot. And uh, so this was very exciting. And we had the find directly dated using radiocarbon dating. And, and luckily our hopes proved true because we, we actually thought it, it's going to be somewhere between five and 10,000 years old, but we were secretly hoping it would be older. And the date came back as 50,000 years before present. So, so this thing is 50,000 years old when there was an ice age going on and, um, and in Northwestern Europe, there were only Neanderthals. So it had to be made by Neanderthals. Um, and that then led into a research project on, on the, the complexity of Neanderthal technology. And in the end, obviously, uh, also addressing questions about uh, Neanderthal cognition, which, which a lot of people, including myself, are interested in. Hmm. Awesome, okay, uh, and yeah. And Sorry, Carol. I was just going to jump jump in there. Sorry, Carol. Hmm. Just, um, I mean, this is, I mean, it's an amazing find. Just to hear, you know, such a story where a lady was walking along and then just picks up such an amazing find. Uh, for me, what's interesting is the preservation of the material, um, given the context of the site. Could you maybe talk to that? I mean, how is it that the material was actually preserved on that um, little uh, flint artifact? Well, so this is this is really really interesting because basically these these birch bark tar finds are rarer than Neanderthal fossils themselves, even, wow. um, and and. and so, so the material decays most of the time. And uh, this find was actually dredged up from the bottom of the North Sea and then um, uh, the, the, the sand in which it was dredged up was, was sprayed onto the beach. And so um, it seems that behind this, this now submerged North Sea, which was, which was dry in the Ice Age because, um, because, of, because a lot of ice was, was locked up in ice, ice caps and sea levels were lower. Anyway, so there's a, a drowned Neanderthal landscape, probably with intact sites where you have still preservation of uh, organic material, of bone, of, of very rare stuff like this, like this birch bark tar. You might even find like wooden implement. It's, it's really frustrating that there is a sea there now. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, it's incredible, it really is incredible. Uh, Tim, you had a you have a question? Yeah, well, I'm glad you just pointed out that the sea wasn't always there because otherwise, you know, we'd be we'd be asking you why this isn't proof that Atlantis exists, but we won't go down that. Mm. Um, just in terms to contextualize this this discussion and your find, 
in terms of the rest of the Neanderthal cultural sequence, because it's not something that we necessarily are very familiar with down here. We don't get it down here. So in the, in the context of Neanderthal cultural material, how sort of significant is this? How does it fit in? Well, this, so this is important because it, it proves something that we really already have been thinking for a long time, namely that Neanderthals were able to half the stone tools that they made. But generally, we only find the stones, so it's very, it's very difficult to find out. And, uh, and, it, and it shows that Neanderthals had actually quite a complex technological system where they made composite tools. And um, we, I mean, we've had similar discussions in Southern Africa where I think research by, for example, Malise Lombard has shown that, that stone tools that we found in the Middle Stone Age in, in Southern Africa were hafted. Um, which a lot of people have had been thinking, but it's very important to show this as well. Um, and and in in the case of this birch bark tar, it's quite difficult to make. It's a, it's not like a, like resin that just drips from a tree. Um, it's there's there's no sign on the outside of a birch that you can if you if you master a, a sort of chemical distillation process that you can get. Uh, a, a black sticky substance that you can use to glue the stone to something else. Um, and and so, so that shows, together with some other stuff, that Neanderthals really were, um, well, were basically amateur chemists. Mm -hmm. Like the, there's another fire related uh, a recent find, namely that, that uh, Neanderthals were introducing some black pigments to, to their sites, manganese. And it was often thought maybe they were using art with or using them to make art and maybe they did but one of the things that you could also do with it is lower the uh, the temperature at, at which you can light a fire so they were probably grinding it okay. and then using that when they when they were lighting their fire so they so they had they were very aware of of mm -hmm. all these little tricks that helped them survive in in which was at that time a very hostile environment yeah uh, Gerard, thanks very much. That's really, uh, really interesting. Just to, to maybe carry on with what Tim was saying. So obviously there is a, a very broad significance for, for this new research. Could you maybe talk a little bit about the current debate? Uh, this is apparently a very lively debate. So could you maybe just talk to that at the moment? Well, this is, uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, we had submitted our paper uh, on this this uh, this star find um, and then we got our reviews back and the paper was accepted and everyone was happy and like two days later another paper comes out in the same journal uh, where where a german team had had done very elegant experiments um, discovering basically a new way to to make the tar and so one of the the things that we were interested in was not just how the tar was used, but also how it was produced. Because, as I said, you, you need to, to, to be able to do a bit of chemistry. Mm. Now, we'd done a CT scan uh, uh, of the find to show like, that there are some, some impurities, some, some contamination is mixed in. And we thought that this showed that the, that the endotols were making like a sort of primitive oven where um, they, 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 they burned wood on the outside and had an, uh, an uh, an environment without oxygen in which to produce the tar because if there's oxygen with that that, that uh, sort of that reaches the tar it just catches fire and you can't use it so you have to you have to heat it in an in an environment that doesn't receive air well anyway we had we had done some experiments and and our experiments fit the archaeology but then there was this other team and they have a have a method where they basically they light a a fire with birch bark and they let the tar uh, condense from the smoke uh, onto a, a, a big a big rock um, and and so their argument is it's much more likely that Neanderthals used used the method that they experimentally uh, uh, documented than the one that we thought was used um, and so now there's a bit of a back and forth about what kind, what, what kind of proof do you need? And, and basically what we need to do is, is, is more experiments. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I guess that, that's a quick summary. Right, that's, that's really, really fascinating. So, um, you know, it's been for numerous years that, that archeologists have sort of 
maybe doubted or or um, have been sort of um, not very accepting of the fact that that Neanderthals were thinking and behaving in very complex ways and, and things like that. So given the sort of uh, debate that's going on, um, does either sort of the, this German team's method imply some sort of like lower standard of of uh, cognitive complexity or, or behavioral complexity surrounding the, the making of the tar because uh, even for me, um, you know, to uh, put a, a big rock over a fire and, and let um, uh, this tar sort of condense and form is still quite a clever trick. Um, and so does that, does that have any sort of implications um, if this team were to have found, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the way that these Neanderthals were actually making this versus your experiments? I, I, don't, I don't think necessarily so. It, it has implications for how uh, Neanderthals organized their, their, their production logistically, but it, I, it's very difficult, I think, and, and, and I think no one uh, claims this. Um, that 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 this require a lower IQ because it still it still requires like a, a, a good understanding of cause and effect or and and like you you're still producing this tar that there's nothing from the birch bark that suggests that it would produce tar if you did it so I think it it still any method still um, uh, requires like like complex reasoning so I, mm. I, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Sorry. Uh, all I right. Just, Kara, sorry, Kara. I just had a chuckle there. Sorry. While, while you're talking there, Kara, because uh, Kara was talking about uh, lighting the fire and it being a, being a clever trick. Now <laughs> we know the, uh, uh, um, the mental cognitive uh, complexity of uh, Kara's abilities. Uh, lighting a fire is uh, part of the upper technological limits of Kara's abilities. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> for, for my family particularly, yes, that is <laughs> quite advanced technology. Thank you, Lauder. Um, Gerrit, uh, to round this off, because I think we're coming up on time, um, we were sort of briefly talking about some of the differences that, that you um, sort of speculate or hypothesize on, on uh, sort of group size um, culture uh, within Neanderthals, comparing that to modern humans um, and models that have been created for the sort of early modern humans uh, along the southern coast of, of South Africa. So could you maybe just give us a, a very, very brief rundown on some of your, your thoughts? What, what sort of separates um, Neanderthal lifeways from modern human lifeways if we were to compare the, these two regions? Well, yeah, as you know, I, I, I'm, I'm also involved in research in Southern Africa in, in, in about the last 70,000 years. And, and I do think, like we know now that Neanderthals are smart. There's, there's no doubt about that. So the old debate, like Neanderthals were smarter than we thought, we should, we should quit that kind of framing. But there are still behavioral differences uh, between early modern humans that, that live in South Africa. Uh, and Neanderthals that we see in Europe. And it's, to me, very interesting to look at, at the, the social circumstances in which Neanderthal live, Neanderthals live. So, th so this find is done from in, at the edge of their, of their distribution in a very hostile environment. They were present in very small social groups, maybe, maybe only 10 people. Um, and they were very uh, highly nomadic, very mobile. So there was, there was very little time to to invest in, 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 in heavy uh, installations, to invest in, in, in big social networks, stuff like that. Now, at the same time in South Africa, the environment's also sometimes quite hostile. It may, it may not be super cold, but, it, but, it, but it, at times it gets very dry. But along the coast, we have a, a, a famous series of sites, that I think on the nomination to become a World Heritage Site, where uh, we see this this early modern behavior, the use of of ochre for engravings, the use of 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 beads, and and so I think that in South Africa people are present in much larger numbers, and they're not only investing in in smart technologies, which we know they do as well, but they are also um, elaborating their social lives uh, and 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 perhaps building alliances and networks over, over uh, uh, among l uh, larger groups of people and maybe also across larger regions. Um, and I think um, in the end that, that may allow 
a, a more connected uh, uh, population may allow, for example, more inventions uh, to be done, technological or social, them also to be, to be uh, um, how do you call it, spread uh, um, more quickly. And Neanderthals um, in, in their lives, sometimes they, there were so few of them across a huge area from Holland, from England even, to, to Siberia, that at times they seem to have had trouble finding suitable partners. So their genetic and anatomical um, indications for things like uh, inbreeding, um, which is not good. And, and we, our ancestors in Southern Africa, we were with a lot of people. They, they, there were always partners, there were always other groups. This, and, and I think this, this may explain some of the behavioral differences between these two species of, 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 of people, basically. Well, both probably had similar IQs, but there's still differences. And I think they, they may be more in the social sphere, if that makes sense. Mm, brilliant. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah just, that's great. Um, Really, really interesting, Gerrit. Thank you very much for, for running us through all that. Uh, really fascinating stuff. And I think um, if you would be so kind, we would probably have you back on at some point to maybe talk a little bit more about this subject. So I think it's intensely interesting to most people, particularly from a Southern African venue who don't really uh, engage a lot with the, the Neanderthal record. This stuff is really, really um, um, quite, quite interesting. Uh, and so I think we're going to call it uh, time there. Uh, thanks for, for joining us and thanks for um, having me. yeah, we hope to have you back on sometime soon. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Sounds good.